Right now in Venezuela, you've got extreme food shortages and poverty. More than one third of the people in Venezuela are only eating one meal per day. One study by the Non-Government Human Rights Commission for Zulia State found that 72% of food items were in short supply in October and November, even as prices soared by 305%. It is so bad that the people in Venezuela have resorted to eating zoo animals and eating out of garbage cans. Experts say the Venezuelan economy has shrunk more than 50% since Nicolas Maduro became president six years ago, and that process has destroyed the buying power of Venezuelans and plunged the country into hyperinflation. Inflation hit nearly 1 million percent in 2018, and it could soar to 10 million percent by the end of this year, according to the International Monetary Fund. This inflation has caused the prices of goods to skyrocket, but more on that in a second because the same Human Rights Commission study found that nearly 75 percent of the homes surveyed reported that at least once over the previous three months, the adults and children were hungry but did not eat. Only 8% reported eating protein every day. So, with hyperinflation, I believe the widely accepted figure would be that inflation is considered to be hyperinflation if the monthly rate of inflation exceeds 50%. For those of you not familiar, inflation is a general increase in prices and a general decrease in the purchasing value of money. To give you an example of what this would mean, take this Zona right here. Luckily for us, they've always been at a steady and arguably iconic 99 cents. And no, I'm not sponsored by Arizona, but I would like to be. Anyways, if our inflation rate reached 51% a month, then if I bought this Zona for 99 cents, on January 1st, one year later at 51% inflation per month, I go to buy another Zona on January 1st and it would cost me about $139. Prices of goods in Venezuela have been doubling every 26 days on average. In 2016, a cup of coffee would run you about 450 bolivars, but in 2018, it would run you a whopping 2.5 million bolivars. You get into some hot water when the supply of your paper currency exceeds the demand for the goods and services that can be purchased with your currency, and then the value of your currency falls as a result. The government wants to spend more money than it has to spend. It wants to spend so much that no one is willing to lend it the amount. So that government uses its central bank to finance its deficit. So now you've got more money flowing in the economy, but it's being used to purchase the same number of goods and services. So naturally, prices rise in order to absorb the extra money. Unless the government manages to close its deficit and balance its budget, it's going to have to print more money to buy the same amount of stuff. Repeat this process a few times, and now your inflation rate is getting higher and higher until you need a whole wheelbarrow full of Venezuela of bucks to buy a cup of joe. We're going to come back to inflation and government spending, all that fun economic stuff, but first to continue to explain the other important dynamic features of Venezuela right now, I want to talk about education, crime, and healthcare. So Venezuela has about 8 million school-aged children in total, and it's estimated that 3 million of them are not attending school consistently or at all anymore. A lot of schools have closed and then later reopened, but only for three days a week. A lot of education experts are afraid that this is going to lead to an entire generation being stunted, and it makes total sense. If you refer to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you'll see that people are not going to be able to go to school and be focused on learning or even teaching if they can't even feed themselves. They used to have food programs at the schools, but they become very inconsistent as a result of food shortages, and they often don't contain any protein. The rising prices have made it much more difficult for people to buy school supplies, transportation to the schools, teachers are getting paid a little over four times the minimum wage, which gives them just a few dollars a month. I read one report where a woman said that with her last paycheck from teaching, she was able to buy a kilo of meat and a kilo of sugar. So definitely not good. And this woman now, like many, many others, is looking to leave Venezuela. She is looking to emigrate, which is something else that we'll talk about in a second. With their healthcare system, Hugo Chavez, who I don't think we've mentioned yet, but he plays a very important role in all of this. And again, we'll get into that in a second. But Hugo Chavez installed free healthcare programs and facilities after he assumed power. And you can trace the evolution of the Venezuelan government, assuming more and more control over the healthcare industries over the course of many decades. But after Chavez established free healthcare programs, and they had help from the Cubans as well, things started to get really bad. They had and still have massive shortages, doctors fleeing the country, lots of transmissible diseases reappearing since they have shortages of vaccines, and the Venezuelan Pharmaceutical Federation has reported shortages in 80% of medical supplies, as well as shortages of food, water, and electricity, which have contributed to an increasing economic and humanitarian crisis affecting much of the country. And then they've got the outbreaks of measles, malaria, all that good stuff. Access to medicines is strictly controlled by the government, and their availability is difficult to predict because of the shortages, and as a result, adequate health care is currently not available through the public health system in Venezuela. In February of 2014, doctors at University of Caracas Medical Hospital stopped performing surgeries due to lack of supplies, even though nearly 3,000 people required surgery. In early 2015, only 35% of hospital beds were available and 50% of operating rooms could not function due to the lack of resources. In March of 2015, a Venezuelan NGO, Red de Medicos por la Salud, reported that there was a 68% shortage of surgical supplies and a 70% shortage of medicine 
medicines in Venezuelan pharmacies. In May of 2015, the Venezuelan Medical Federation said that 15,000 doctors had left the public health care system due to drug and equipment shortages and poor pay. In August of 2015, the Human Rights Watch said, quote, We have rarely seen access to essential medicines deteriorate as quickly as it has in Venezuela except in war zones, end quote. By the end of 2015, the Bolivarian government reported that of all Venezuelans visiting public hospitals that year, one in three patients died. Also in 2015, 30% of all reported malaria cases in the Americas were in Venezuela, even more than Brazil, which has a much larger population. In 2016, according to the Venezuelan government, 240,000 cases of malaria were reported, rising 76% in a year. According to former Venezuelan health minister José Félix Oleta, more than 500,000 Venezuelans would contract malaria in 2017, and a study of 6,500 households by three of the main universities in Venezuela found that 74% of the population had lost an average of 19 pounds in 2016. In short, it's not good. Now on to crime. In Venezuela, they have widespread crime, violence, murder, kidnapping. It has one of the highest murder rates in the world. I believe it's in the top three. Now, crime rates increased rapidly under Hugo Chavez, and that was largely because the police were underfunded and also because his entire shtick, what got him elected, was that he was complaining about inequality. He promised that he was going to eliminate inequality. He promoted class conflict and social fragmentation in order to gain power. And as a result of this ideology, criminal gangs were being encouraged to rob, extort, murder, and kidnap. By the time Chavez died in 2013, Gallup reported that Venezuela was the most insecure nation in the world. To this day, crime in Venezuela is rampant, and its citizens consider it to be their greatest concern, along with food shortages, which also causes looting and related crimes. And according to the Office of the Prosecutor Generals of Venezuela, 98% of crimes in Venezuela do not result in prosecution. So that's basically what's going on right now in Venezuela. Now, let's flash back and talk about what Venezuela used to be like before Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. I think that the pre-Chavez period is often referred to as the glory days of Venezuela. And I also know that a lot of people still revere Chavez to this day. What's interesting is that before Chavez was elected to power, there was a series of gradual economic interventionism that led to the instability that Chavez used to obtain power in the first place. And we see this all over the world now, even today, especially in America, that problems that were caused in the first place by government intervention, whether it be healthcare, college tuition, problems that the government caused in the first place. And then we're told that the solution to these problems is actually more government intervention, which of course is not the case. Anyways, what has made Venezuela so prosperous, at least in the past, is one very important resource, and that is oil. In 1908, this guy named Juan Vicente Gomez became president of Venezuela and granted several concessions for the exploration of oil to his friends and family members. And then in April of 1914, they had completed their first oil field, and between 1914 and 1917, they discovered more oil fields, including the Bolivar Coastal Field, which is the largest oil field in South America. Before this, Venezuela was something of a banana republic. There was political instability resulting from their colonial colonial past with Spain, and even after they gained independence from Spain, they maintained a lot of their mercantilist and regulatory economic policies that effectively kept them impoverished. Then in the early 20th century, they discovered their vast oil resources, and they're like, hey, agricultural guys, cool aristocracy, but we just kind of made our own thing here. We're calling ourselves the industrialist class, and we're trying to open up our markets for multinational exploitation and investment, so you guys are going to have to dip, essentially. So now by the 1950s, Venezuela has become one of the most prosperous countries in Latin America. And this is because the guy that we talked about, Gomez, throughout the 1920s and 1930s, he had been allowing for both domestic and foreign market actors to exploit the newly discovered oil deposits in Venezuela. Then in the 1950s, this other dude named Marcos Perez Jimenez hopped on and kept the ball rolling. By the way, Actually, probably all of the people we're talking about here are just not good. I mean, there's a lot of criticism and brutality circulating all of them, but that's a different discussion. Anyways, by the 1950s, Venezuela had the fourth largest per capita GDP in the world, behind only the United States, Switzerland, and New Zealand. Oil exploitation, obviously a potential MVP here for this increase in prosperity, but we also have to look at the fact that between the 1920s and the 1970s, Venezuela had a relatively free economy, they had an immigration system that attracted and assimilated laborers from Spain, Portugal, and Italy, they had a system of strong property rights, and this all allowed them to experience this unprecedented prosperity up until the 1970s. During the military dictatorship of Jimenez, Venezuela was at the height of its prosperity, and just like the Gomez regime, there was a lot of political repression. Jimenez did introduce some elements 
elements of what we would refer to as crony capitalism, things like large public works projects, increased state involvement in things like the steel industry, but he let the price system work itself out. He didn't get cheesed about foreign investment, and he didn't create an enormous welfare state. Speaking of getting cheesed, turns out Humane's opposition was pretty done with his heavy-handed ruling, so they got the support of the military and overthrew him in 1958. He was exiled and from then on extensively ridiculed by Venezuelan intellectuals and politicians. Following that, this naval officer guy filled in for a bit until they had general elections later in the year where Social Democrat Romulo Betancourt won and then under him the Fourth Republic of Venezuela would be established, which would be their longest period of democratic rule. In 1961, a constitution was introduced and they divided the government into three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial, like a bunch of copycats, and they established an activist role for the Venezuelan state in economic affairs. So everyone's all happy. They returned to democracy in 1958. They're expecting to continue being prosperous. They're expecting to start being politically stable. But guess what? Remember that guy that established the Fourth Republic of Venezuela, Romulo Betancourt? Yeah, plot twist. Buddy was an ex-communist, but he maintained that he rejected Marxism because he was in favor of a more, quote, gradual approach to the implementation of socialism. So despite evolving into more of a social democrat, he still believed that the state should serve an activist role in economic matters. This guy was part of a generation of intellectuals and student activists that aimed to fully nationalize the petroleum sector of Venezuela and use its profits to establish a welfare state. They believed that in order for Venezuela to become a truly independent country, they were going to have to free themselves from the foreign interests of foreign influencers, and therefore the government should have complete domain over the oil sector. The nationalized oil industry was meant to provide cheap gasoline, free education at all levels, healthcare, and other services. This type of rhetoric resonated very well with lower and middle class Venezuelans, and those people would go on to become a very significant proportion of Bentancourt's party, the Acción Democrática. This vision essentially entailed that the government would centrally plan the economy, oil would be produced and administered by the state, while government would try to phase out the rest of the private sector. Betancourt himself wasn't as successful with these ideas as later Fourth Republic governments, but what he did do was implement a few troubling policies such as the devaluation of the Venezuelan currency, the Bolivar, the failed land reform that encouraged squatting and undermined the property rights of landowners, and the establishment of a constitutional order based on positive rights and an active role for the Venezuelan state in economic affairs. He also saw significant Significant tax increases, income tax tripled to 36%, and of course this was followed by spending increases. And of course this was followed by the Venezuelan government generating deficits because of their failure to control their spending on social programs. He never got to nationalize the oil industry like he had hoped to, however, his government did lay the foundation for that to be done. Because of the oil boom in the 1970s, the government of Carlos Andreas Perez was able to capitalize on the unprecedented flow of petroleum rents being brought about by the 1970s energy crisis, during which oil producing countries such as Venezuela were able to to reap considerable benefits because of the high oil prices. That being said, finally in 1975, Perez nationalized the petroleum sector. This nationalization fundamentally changed the entire composition of the Venezuelan economy. Venezuela turned into a petro state, and the concept of those being governed needing to consent essentially went out the window. Instead of the Venezuelans paying taxes to the governments in exchange for the protection of property and similar freedoms, like how the United States tax system was supposed to function in theory, the Venezuelan state would employ patrimonialism by bribing its citizens with handouts in order to to maintain power over them. Countries based on more liberal frameworks, and I swear to God, if I hear this one more time, one person tell me, the United States was not founded on a liberal framework. I'm gonna smite someone with the jawbone of an ass, to quote an old French teacher of mine. But liberal countries with a limited framework of government have citizens paying taxes as a means to the ends of protecting the life, liberty, and property of the citizens. But the state is not the owner. And since the state is not the owner, the citizens can easily check the power of the governments if and when it tries to expand its power, since the citizens aren't dependent on it for anything yet except for enforcing rights. But honestly, that's part of why we have guns too. But still, the government doesn't provide me with food, healthcare, housing, whatever. So I'm not dependent on it. I can function independently of it. When the government takes control of these things, that's when I become dependent on it and therefore will not necessarily be able to check its power as it continues to expand. So Perez took advantage of this power grab by the state to finance a superfluous welfare state. And all this resonated well with the populace because, hey, free stuff. As a result, deficit spending was embraced by the political class and increasing levels of foreign and public debt would become the Norman Venezuelan fiscal policy. During periods of high oil prices, the government would use the rents to finance public works and social projects as a means to pacify the citizens. No real wealth creation took place during these periods. The state redistributed the rents according to political whims. When politicians and bureaucrats oversee business, the concerns are no longer efficiency and the interests of the consumer. The concerns are partisan and state interests. The nationalization of the petroleum industry 
didn't immediately cause economic downturn. However, it did lay the foundation for what would end up happening in the 1980s and 1990s. The 1970s looked like a never-ending party thanks to high oil prices. Perez used those rents to finance all of his social programs, but then guess what happened? Oil prices dropped in the early to mid-1980s. New character here, his name is Louis Herrera Campaigns, and uh, he got into office after Perez. He very soon realized that the levels at which Perez was spending were not sustainable. He claimed that Perez had left him a, quote, mortgaged country, but he still went ahead and continued more of the same cronyist policies that Perez had been acting with. But then something bad happened. The Bolivar, the Venezuelan currency, experienced its largest devaluation to date. The Venezuelan government tried to help itself financially by just printing money. 1983 is when this happened, and it's also the last year that Venezuela has had a single-digit inflation percentage. Herrera decided to respond by implementing heavy-handed exchange controls trying to stop the flight of capital. These controls were implemented by an agency called the Differential Exchange Rate Regime, which effectively created a multi-tiered system of exchange rates. Now, you've got corruption scandals, you've got members of the political class exploiting this exchange rate system for their own gain. What this whole thing did, it's referred to as Black Friday, is set the stage for subsequent currency devaluations, controls, and irresponsible fiscal policy in the future. So, Venezuela's got rising poverty rates, increased foreign and public debt, corrupt state enterprises, and burdensome economic regulations. All of that is contributing to rising social tensions throughout the 1980s. It's ace in the hole. Its oil reserves couldn't bail it out this time since the price of oil was so low. Remember Perez? He's back now. He's running for office again in 1988, and ironically, he was the guy that established the vast welfare state and laid the foundations for all of these problems. But now he's campaigning on this sort of make Venezuela great again kind of thing. He's promising to bring the prosperity of the 1970s, but once he gets in office, he realizes that the country is on the brink of bankruptcy. There's too much state intervention in the economy. Enter stage left, the International Monetary Fund. Perez is advised on reforming Venezuela's broken petro state. After they all broke it down, they decided on reforms like tariff reductions, tax hikes, flawed privatizations, and marginal spending cuts that didn't address the underlying problems with the Venezuelan political economy. It's flawed monetary policy, burdensome regulatory framework, and entrenched crony capitalist policies. These reforms proved to be too much for Perez's party, Acción Democrática, since said reforms would hack away at certain facets of the cronyist petro state that it depended on to maintain its political power. Finally, Enter Hugo Chavez. People were taking to the streets to protest the, quote, austerity policies of the Perez government. This eventually led to the Caracazo incident in 1989, during which the capital city was engulfed in a series of protests that left hundreds dead. In the midst of all the political chaos, radical groups took advantage of the turmoil to advance their own agenda. One of the most famous was then-Lieutenant Colonel Hugo Chavez's group, Revolutionary Bolivarian Movement 200. Chavez took advantage of the political disarray by consolidating an anti-government movement within the ranks of the Venezuelan military. This culminated in the failed coup attempts of 1992. Even though Chavez was imprisoned for his coup attempt, Chavez's agitation was enough to put the whole bipartisan Punta Fijo model into question. Eventually, corruption scandals and rising degrees of social unrest would whittle away at the legitimacy of the Perez administration. The final nail in the coffin came when Perez was impeached for corruption charges in 1992, thus putting the Punta Fijo model on the ropes. Two coup attempts and the impeachment of Carl Andreas Perez marked the beginning of a hectic 1990s for Venezuela. The Venezuela of the 19 1950s and 1970s, characterized by economic prosperity and political stability, had become a distant memory. By 1994, the Punta Fijo model was in shambles as Rafael Caldera assumed the presidency under a new coalition, Convergencia, or Convergence, of disaffected political parties. Policy-wise, Rafael Caldera did not rock the boat. He pursued several of the IMF's half measures while not addressing structural problems such as the privatization of the oil industry, Venezuela's downward spiraling monetary policy, and big business's cozy relationship with the state. In addition, Caldera pardoned Hugo Chavez in 1994, rehabilitating him politically. Thanks to the failed land reforms and housing subsidization policy pursued by the two major social democrat parties, AD and COPEI, during previous decades, major metropolitan areas like Caracas, Merequebo, Merique, and Valencia <clears throat> began to be populated by a growing subsect of impoverished Venezuelans. Chavez would tap into this low stratum of Venezuelan society and effectively turn them into shock troops for his campaign to radically transform Venezuela into a full-blown socialist state. It is undeniable that Venezuela's social democratic consensus delivered suboptimal results. From 1958 to 1998, Venezuela's per capita GDP growth was a paltry negative 0.13%, indicating that the Venezuelan populace grew faster than the wealth produced in that time frame. Venezuela was one 
of two countries in Latin America that suffered negative growth during this 40-year period, the other being Nicaragua, a country that suffered a costly civil war and was under the rule of a socialist government. Chavez capitalized on this stagnation by launching a campaign against the bipartisan political consensus that ruled Venezuela at that time, branding himself as a third-way candidate. Chavez sought to provide an alternative to the perceived corruption of the Punta Fijo political order. Despite the rosy rhetoric, Chavez was surrounding himself with hardened Marxists and other collectivist figures that were hellbent on subverting Venezuela's already fragile political order. Little did the disillusioned voters that cast a ballot for Chavez know what they were about to get themselves into. While Chavez may have been correct in pointing out the corruption of the old Punta Fijo order, he would ironically continue many of its failed policies throughout his regime, amplifying their disastrous effects and implementing them in a tyrannical fashion. Currency controls, expropriations, price controls, and the use of the state-owned oil company PDVSA to finance lavish social spending programs were fixtures of Hugo Chavez's socialist economic policy. In addition, Venezuelan political institutions were completely eviscerated, media outlets were suppressed, and political activists were subject to numerous human rights violations under Chavez's heavy-handed ruling. Chavez had the luxury of high oil prices from 2003 to 2010 to finance his socialist schemes and channel the petroleum rents to consolidate political support in the short term. But once oil prices prices plummeted, the laws of economics reared their ugly head, and the system began to unravel in no time. Even with Chavez's death in 2013, his brand of tyrannical socialism has continued unabated under the rule of his successor, Nicolas Maduro. Almost caught up here. So, after Chavez died of cancer, Maduro was elected to replace him less than a month later by winning 50.6% of the vote. Chavez had been grooming Maduro to act just like he would have in the event of his death. Chavez was charismatic and loved by the people because of the social programs that he put so much money into after nationalizing the oil industry. The policies were effective at first, but as always goes with socialism, it's effective until you run out of other people's money. When Maduro entered office, he continued spending and sent the country into an economic spiral. On January 23rd, 2000. 2014, in the midst of violence and food shortages and a scarcity of basic goods, opposition leaders <clears throat> Leopoldo Lopez and Maria Corina Machado had began a campaign to remove Maduro from office. That February, thousands of Venezuelans took to the streets to protest, and over a three-month period of violent protests, 43 people were killed. Venezuela's central bank confirmed on December 30th of that year that the country had entered a recession due to plummeting oil prices. Inflation began to increase and the government was forced to make cuts in public spending, which made it difficult for Venezuelans to access things like food and medicine. Pause. Why did oil prices drop? Well, firstly, the U.S. dollar was at a 12-year high against the euro, leading to appreciation in the U.S. dollar index. In other words, when the value of the U.S. dollar is strong, the value of global commodities falls. Another factor was that OPEC had decided against cutting oil production to maintain higher prices. Iran, Venezuela, and Algeria all wanted to cut production, but countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE refused. Iraq not only maintained its supply, but actually increased it. This all resulted in an oversupply of oil, which of course put downward pressure on the prices. Additionally, global demand for oil dropped as the economies of Europe and other developing countries were weakening, while at the same time vehicles were becoming more efficient and the currency of China, the world's largest oil importer, was devaluing to an extent that led people to believe that its economy might be worse off than anticipated, so traders dumped oil shares. Okay, so back to Maduro. In the legislative elections held on December 6th, the opposition party gained a two-thirds supermajority in the National Assembly. Maduro, feeling for the security of his position, went ahead and stacked the Supreme Court with justices that are loyal to him. On December 30th, the Supreme Court blocked four newly elected lawmakers from joining the assembly just days before they were due to be sworn in, which Maduro's critics rightfully criticized as an attempt to chip away at the power of the opposition. Fast forward to 2017, the Supreme Court is added again. This time they banned an opposition leader from participating in the April 7th elections. The next day, Venezuelans responded with mass demonstrations all over the country. The protests lasted for months, resulting in violent clashes with riot police that left 66 dead. Presidential elections were held in May of 2018, and Maduro was re-elected despite multiple claims of fraud from the opposition. On November 8th, the United Nations Refugee Agency announced that over 3 million people had fled Venezuela due to massive shortages of food and medicine. Not long after Maduro's inauguration in January, Venezuelans took to the streets calling for him to step down. Guado, leading the opposition, cited the emergency powers of the Constitution and claimed the presidency for himself. The United States declared support for Guado. Maduro got butthurt and severed all diplomatic ties with the United States, giving all American diplomats diplomat 72 hours to leave the country. Humanitarian aid from the United States arrived to the border of Venezuela on February 8th. Maduro blocked it. 
On February 21st, Maduro closed the border Venezuela shares with Brazil in an effort to block aid from coming into the country. A day later, at least two civilians were killed and dozens were injured when Venezuelan security forces fired on protesters near the Brazilian border. According to Harold Trincunas, the deputy director for the Center of International Security and Cooperation of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University, what a title, quote, the Venezuelan military, especially at the most senior levels, is heavily complicit in many of the crimes going on inside Venezuela related to human rights abuses and drug trafficking, so they can't really afford to have a transition to democracy because of the fear of being held accountable, end quote. In other words, the Venezuelan military has an incentive to stay loyal to Maduro because if they are taken out of power, they will face severe penalties for their actions. Still with me? All right, so now that we've given as brief a timeline as possible while still doing it justice, I want to go through a few key elements of what led Venezuela to where it is now and how we can avoid making the same mistakes that they did. I've got nine of them here and no particular order of importance or chronology. I'll leave that for you to decide. First, economic regulation. Since Chavez came into power, business freedom has ranked below the average in the global marketplace and has been declining more and more as time passes, even into the Maduro regime. The same thing is true with their property rights. They are alarmingly below the global average. We know that property rights are essential for both personal and economic freedom. As Hernando de Soto notes in his book, The Mystery of Capital, many of the poorest countries in the world possess enormous amounts of capital, but their ownership is insecure because of faulty or non-existent property law or property rights protections. The value of private savings in the poor countries of the world is 40 times the amount of foreign aid that they have received since 1945. The problem is that the citizens of poorer countries hold these resources in defective forms. Houses built on land whose ownership rights are not adequately recorded, unincorporated businesses with undefined liability, industries located where financiers and investors cannot see them, etc. Because the rights to these possessions are not adequately documented, these assets cannot readily be turned into capital, cannot be traded outside of narrow local circles, cannot be used is collateral for a loan and cannot be used as a share against an investment. In Western countries, by contrast, every parcel of land, every building, every piece of equipment or store on inventories is represented in a property document that is a visible sign of a vast hidden process that connects all these assets to the rest of the economy. In the United States, for example, the single most important source of collateral for a small business loan is the mortgage on the small business owner's house. Because governments in poorer countries have failed to enforce property rights, the people of these countries lack the ability on any large scale to create capital and become entrepreneurs. Without capital, there can be no capitalism. The same goes for their monetary freedom, investment freedom, trade freedom, financial freedom, and labor freedom, all far below the global average in Venezuela. Many wealthy Venezuelan entrepreneurs have since left the country, moving to countries like Spain to do business in freedom, not only because of the economic regulations, but because of the catastrophic results of other governments' intervention that we'll discuss in a moment. Socialism does not create wealth. It redistributes wealth that is created by free trade. When entrepreneurs and high-aptitude people are no longer able to prosper in an environment, they will leave even take their prosperity somewhere else. There is often no home country loyalty if the well-being of someone's family is at stake. Government intervention in Venezuelan medicine has caused one-third of all Venezuelan doctors to leave the country in the midst of shortages, hyperinflation, and socialized medicine. Doctors working in public hospitals can expect starting salaries of four to five dollars per month, but that is quickly devalued by inflation. Nearly half the doctors working in public hospitals have left the country. The doctors working in private clinics are not as harshly affected by these conditions, but they're still affected by the general degradation of the Venezuelan economy and social fabric. You generally don't wake up and go to work every morning because you want to help other people. You generally wake up and go to work every morning because you have to provide for yourself and your family. If your country no longer affords you the opportunity to do that, it is likely that you will want to leave. The great thing about economic regulation, if you're a statist, is that when it almost inevitably disrupts the economy, you can often blame the disruptions on the free market and seduce people into allowing you to assume more control over it until they're completely dependent on you, the state, to survive, and that's exactly what happened as we'll explain in a moment. Number two, price controls. Democrats have advocated and still do advocate for price controls. Price controls by definition are government regulations establishing a maximum or minimum price to be charged for specific goods and services. If you've taken a high school economics class, you're familiar with this graph that displays how price controls lead to shortages or surpluses, but not in this case. The Venezuelan government set price controls in 2003 on around 400 basic foods in an effort, according to the Washington Post, to quote, counter inflation and protect the poor. Always good intentions and in March 2009, they set minimum production quotas for 12 basic foods that were subject to price controls, including white rice, cooking oil, coffee, sugar, powdered milk, cheese, and tomato sauce. However, the lack of free-floating currency meant that the government was overpaying for these foods, which led to shortages as a limited amount of these foods began to be imported, even while demand was growing. The Maduro administration has denied the extent of the crisis and has refused to accept humanitarian aid from Amnesty International, the United Nations, and other groups as conditions
conditions have worsened. The United Nations and the Organization of American States have stated that the shortages have resulted in unnecessary deaths in Venezuela and have urged the government to accept humanitarian aid. According to the New York Times, the Maduro administration was, quote, responsible for grossly mismanaging the economy and plunging the country into a deep humanitarian crisis in which many people lack food and medical care. Maduro has stated that, quote, Venezuela is not a country of famine. It has very high levels of nutrients and access to food. Because of these price controls, domestic production dropped since producers had lost their incentive to produce. And when oil profits began declining in 2014, Maduro began limiting imports needed by Venezuelans and shortages began to grow. Foreign reserves, usually safe for economic distress, were being spent to service debt and avoid default instead of being used to purchase imported goods. Domestic production, which had already been damaged by government policies, was unable to replace the necessary imported goods. According to economist Angel Allion, quote, the Venezuelan government has direct control over food distribution in Venezuela, and the movement of all food, even among private companies, is controlled by the government. Allion states that the problem is not distribution, however, but production, since nobody can distribute what is not produced. Number three, worker co-ops. This is something that has always been advocated for by the left as a way to create an egalitarian, anti-capitalist society. A worker cooperative is described as a values-driven business that puts worker and community benefit at the core of its purpose. The two central characteristics of worker cooperatives are workers own the business and they participate in its financial success on the basis of their labor contribution to the cooperative, and workers have representation on and vote for the board of directors, adhering to the principle of one worker, one vote each. Elizabeth Warren has somewhat recently proposed legislation that would steer business in this direction. Since Chavez was elected in 1998 after running on a platform of returning wealth to the citizens, ma income inequality, over 100,000 worker-owned cooperatives representing approximately 1.5 million people were formed with the assistance of government startup credit, technical training, and by giving preferential treatment to cooperatives and state purchases of goods and equipment, all of course financed by the oil revenue from the oil industry, which was now nationalized. More on that in a second. In actuality, 280,000 cooperatives, not just 100,000, were registered, but those other ones either collapsed or just never became active. As of 2005, approximately 16% of Venezuela's formerly employed citizens were employed in a cooperative. However, a 2006 census showed that as many as 50% of the cooperatives were either dysfunctional or were fraudulently created to gain access to public funds. This stinging critique about the high rate of failure among registered cooperatives prompted President Chavez to shift the government's approach from cooperatives to, quote, socialist enterprises and worker takeovers of factories. In this way, the government pays the salaries but keeps the ownership and can guarantee that the enterprise does not close. This led to more government overreach into businesses. To the credit of the worker co-ops, 80% of the ones that were functional did not receive support from the Venezuelan government. And that's a whole other discussion, but the problem here is that the government was subsidizing risky loans to the people that wanted to create worker cooperatives in the name of Chavez's message, and then when half of them inevitably failed, Chavez used this as a way to increase state control over the economy. Number four, industry nationalization. Venezuela's oil production reached an all-time high in 1970 when the country produced 3.8 million barrels per day. In 1971, Venezuela nationalized its natural gas industry and began taking steps to nationalize its oil industry. The oil industry was officially nationalized in 1976. At that time, the Venezuelan state-owned oil company, PDVSA, was formed. Between 1970 and 1985, oil production in Venezuela experienced a decline of over 50%, but then production there once again began to grow. In 1997, as it sought to attract foreign investment in develop the heavy oil in the Orinoco belt, Venezuela opened up its oil industry to foreign investment. By 1998, Venezuela's oil production had recovered to 3.5 million barrels per day, nearly reaching its former high. In 1999, Hugo Chavez began serving as president of Venezuela. During the Venezuelan general strike of 2002 and 2003, Chavez fired 19,000 employees of PDVSA and replaced them with employees loyal to his government. Problems occurred and oil production dropped. The first is the removal of expertise required to develop the country's heavy oil. This started with the firing of PDVSA employees in 2003 and continued with pushing international expertise out of the country in 2007. Second, the Chavez government failed to appreciate the level of capital expenditures required to continue developing the country's oil. This was in no small part due to inexperience among the Chavez loyalists that were now running PDVSA. When oil prices were high, Chavez funneled billions from the oil industry into the country's social programs, but he failed to reinvest adequately in this capital-intensive industry. Following the 2007 expropriations, Venezuela's oil production went on a steep decline. In 2018, Venezuela's oil production fell to 1.5 million barrels per day, a decrease of more than 50% below 2006 levels. According to a CBS News article in April of 2008, Chavez 
ordered the nationalization of the cement industry in response to the fact that the industry was exporting its products in order to receive prices above those which it was allowed to obtain within the country. In 2013, it was reported that the production of cement dropped by 60%. Furnaces stopped and cement had to be imported from Colombia. It was also reported that some stores had shortages of cement and would ration the number of cement bags purchased. Chavez nationalized Venezuela's largest telephone companies and electric utilities. The main telephone company, CANTV, was nationalized by buying U.S.-based Verizon Communications 28.5% share for $572 million. Since the nationalizations of communications companies, allegations of censorship by the government and CANTV have been made, especially during the 2014 Venezuelan protests. The nation's largest private electricity producer, 82% owned by U.S.-based AES Corp., was obtained by paying $740 million to AES for its share. Since then, Venezuela's electrical grid has been plagued with occasional blackouts in various districts of the country. In 2011, it had so many problems that rations on electricity were put in place to help ease blackouts. On September 3, 2014, 70% of the country plunged into darkness with 14 of 23 states stating that they did not have electricity for most of the day. In 2008, the Venezuelan government nationalized the leading steel company, Argentine Controlled Cedar, following months of strikes and labor management disputes. Since the nationalization of Cedar, the production of the company has dropped every year. To summarize, nationalization of industry is inherently less efficient and serves against the best interests of the people that were supposed to benefit from it. Again, always good intentions. Number five, more good intentions with the wild amount of spending on social programs. Chavez was elected to the presidency in 1998, pledging to use the vast oil wealth on social programs that would reduce poverty and inequality. He called these programs the Bolivarian Missions, and they were, of course, initially effective until, as always is the case with socialism, you run out of other people's money. Not only was Chavez's social system not set up to withstand a collapse of oil prices, he himself actually made decisions that led to a decrease in their production of oil, as we mentioned. Because domestic production had decreased and the people of Venezuela were reliant on the social services that formed the core of the government's agenda, things like free education and medical care being paid for by the oil industry, the country could not afford to see their oil revenue decrease. We see this a lot in America now. We have politicians trying to buy votes by promising handouts, everything from free college to free tampons. Of course, nothing is free. Someone is going to have to pick up the tab. Unfortunately for Venezuela, Venezuela, they were relying on their oil reserves to always pick up the tab, but the guy they put in charge not only increased their tab, but decreased their oil output that was supposed to pay for said tab. By 2012, according to CNBC, public spending in Venezuela accounted for more than 50% of Venezuela's GDP. Chavez also borrowed money from other countries to keep the social programs afloat, and by 2013, Venezuela's foreign debt climbed to over $106 billion. Chavez had been warned about the unsustainability of these programs, but he knew that they were the only way to win over the people, so he ignored the warnings in order to maintain his power. When oil revenue dropped, the government lost the ability to subsidize basic goods and services for its people. Number six, inflation. What do you do when you need money but you don't have it? You just print it, obviously. When Maduro assumed office, he followed in the footsteps of Chavez with spending and in the footsteps of other countries that have needed money they don't have to pay off debts. And he started the process that would become hyperinflation. The savings of the citizens were destroyed and productive business investment became impossible. We covered inflation and hyperinflation in the beginning of the video, but Maduro continues the process because he's in denial about the severity of the crisis. Now he's got a proposed monetary reform that would remove five zeros from prices. So a product that costs 100,000 bolivars would only cost one bolivar. Bolivar, and then that currency would be renamed the Sovereign Bolivar. He then wants to devalue the currency by 95% and then peg the Bolivar to the Petro, which is Venezuela's digital currency backed by oil introduced in February of 2018. He wants to combine these reforms with hiking the minimum wage by over 3,000%, boost the corporate tax rate, and increase highly subsidized gas prices. Economists are highly skeptical of these reforms because there is no substantial fiscal reform in the works or announced shifts in policy making, and that these reforms don't even address the underlying cause of the hyperinflation. They also think that it will make the hyperinflation worse and will probably cause it to overtake the rate of hyperinflation reached by Zimbabwe. This seems to be an inevitable consequence of not understanding that money is a physical manifestation of value that can be traded for other things of value. Leftists regard money as a zero-sum game. They think that if I have $20 and you have $0, it's because I stole from you. The beautiful thing about the free market is that it allows for the creation of wealth through the creation of value. Centralized economies don't allow for this value creation, therefore they don't allow for additional wealth creation. So when 
when they need money, they have to print it because they view it as just a thing, not a token of value, just a thing that some have and some don't. And since it's just a thing, why shouldn't they be able to print more of it when they need it? Number seven, economic mismanagement. I've tried to give a detailed explanation of this whole thing, but regardless of the historical context that I've established, the detailed policy prescriptions, whatever, the defense of what has happened in Venezuela by the left and by the people that to this day will shamelessly advocate for the policies that have led Venezuela to its current state and have led countless other countries to similar states is always that it was just a result of economic mismanagement. Had they only managed the economy better, everything would have been fine. Here's the problem with that, a problem that they seemingly fail to recognize. Economic mismanagement is inherent to central planning. Central planning is inherently mismanaged relative to free economies. The more complex an economy becomes, the more decentralized that economy will have to be in order to function efficiently. One governing body overseeing the economy cannot possibly do it as efficiently as private companies do it themselves. The two most common arguments against central planning would probably be the information argument from Hayek, which is essentially that there's so much dispersed and often contradictory information that no one body would ever be able to figure out what and how much of it needs to be produced. And then the calculation argument from Mize, which is essentially that in the absence of private property and a price determining market, market economic calculation would be impossible. In other words, it is argued that central planning leads to shortages and wasted resources. I wonder if there are any historical examples of this. While we're on the topic, some journals have argued that with the increase and the sophistication of artificial intelligence, eventually systems will exist that could do this. Maybe AI can analyze trends from the past, but what sets humans apart is that we have free will. Our actions aren't bound by things entered into equations. There's no guarantee that past trends will hold in the future. The error in thinking that a near constant stream of almost real-time data will be of any use is a mentality that sees the world as static and unchanging. The AI would have to be able to see ahead of the curve to such a degree that no technology will likely be able to do anything similar to for at least a few generations. Another common argument is that the existence of corporations such as Walmart and Amazon that engage in large-scale central planning are proof that a centrally planned economy could work. First, note the difference between the economy of a country and a private firm. Second, in a centrally planned economy, the abolition of markets for such factors prevents the formation of the prices needed for economic calculation. Walmart, like many large corporations, has independent divisions that make extensive use of cost and capital accounting and are able to assess their profitability. One of these divisions is its massive distribution and logistics division made up of tens of thousands of tractor trailers, warehouses, and other distribution and logistics equipment. But as massive as this division is, similar firms of different sizes also also have distribution and logistics divisions. Together they form a distribution and logistics market where free exchange takes place and prices of such factors are established. If Walmart goes on a buying spree and attempts to vertically integrate all distribution and logistics businesses, along with all the complementary businesses that support these firms in the world, like semi-truck manufacturers for example, there is an upper limit beyond which efficiency would be compromised. In a situation where Walmart totally absorbs the distribution and logistics market, the same economic calculation problem as under socialism will be encountered. Walmart knows this, which is why it operates operates in the way that it does. Unlike the state, Walmart must remain efficient in order to continue its operations. The state, on the other hand, only needs to remain more powerful than its citizens. That brings us to number eight, gun control. Gun ownership is essential for a free society. In Venezuela, they have no right to bear arms like we do in the United States. Venezuela banned the sale of firearms and ammunition to civilians in 2012, and Chavez stated that the ultimate goal was to disarm all citizens. Flashback to 1939, they passed the law on arms and explosives that prohibited civilians to possess, quote, weapons of war. You know, things like cannons, rifles, mortars, machine guns, submachine guns, carbines, pistols, and revolvers. The only firearms that civilians could own were shotguns and 22 caliber rifles, and in certain circumstances, handguns, provided that they had a license. When Chavez took power, he maintained and even expanded the current gun control laws. In 2002, the Venezuelan government passed the first version of the Control of Arms, Munitions, and Disarmament Act, reinforcing the state's iron grip on firearms in Venezuela. A decade later, the law was modified to enhance the scope of gun control and gave the Venezuelan armed forces exclusive power to control, register, and potentially confiscate firearms. Even MSNBC recognized recognizes how disastrous this has been for the Venezuelan people. In the United States, we have the right to bear arms to check the power of the government. Take that away, all we're left with is crossing our fingers, hoping that our government is nice to us, despite virtually every other all-powerful government in history failing to follow suit. To that, of course, we're always told, but that will never happen here. And that leads me to my final point, number nine, 
All of this was consensual. It always is. Sure, they might not have had the same access to firearms that we do in the United States, but everything that we mentioned, all of these elections, the people that were voted into power were voted into power democratically before the voter fraud, before the tyranny had established itself. Remember, earlier we talked about the constitution that they had set up for themselves that was structured very similarly to our own constitution. They had the power and now it's gone. They allowed themselves to be seduced by the promises of free goods and services, by the promises of a reduction of income inequality, promises of finally holding these rich people accountable accountable because, after all, they were to blame for the suffering. And, as always, their economy collapsed. Their freedom disappeared. They don't care about you. They don't care about whether or not you have access to health care. They don't care about whether or not you have access to food. All they care about is asserting their power, with the end result being all of the wealth being concentrated in the hands of the politicians and the elites, which ironically is what we're told is happening now in the United States. Because humans are not equal in their abilities and interests, a free market system will inevitably produce inequality. A centralized economy, because of this, will also produce inequality. The difference is, in a free market economy, the ditch digger is poor because he's only making about $1,000 a month, while a doctor is easily making $20,000 a month. In a centralized economy, the ditch digger is digging through the trash for food, and the doctor collects his $5 monthly paycheck and then joins him.